Yes. Now no, no, you can start. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Shilpa, and all the volunteers and the Symbiosis Biodiversity Cell for uh, having me here. Um, as I listen to Shilpa's description of the biodiversity cell, it is uh, very close to my heart because uh, I come from a city where uh, biodiversity is celebrated almost every day. I think uh, we have in Bangalore, we have we used to have uh, these weekly every Sunday bird watching outings. So every Sunday used to be um, uh, like a group of volunteers would take newbies out or even experienced people out for bird watching in different lakes. And that of course is stopped now because of the pandemic, but uh, it's a vibrant city. We have bird walks, we have ant walks, we have tree walks, we have walks for pretty much everything. So we have a lot of mentors here and to hear about what the biodiversity cell is doing is really very special and uh, kudos to all of you to continue the good work. Um, and uh, Shilpa already mentioned that, uh, and Prashita mentioned about what I do. Uh, I also freelance as a cinematographer slash camera person for uh, national and, and uh, international productions. And uh, I do these uh, short films with local forest departments and NGOs. And for that, I team up with my husband, uh, Rana Belur. Um, so with this, let me get into uh, sharing my presentation. Is this visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma so I want to talk to you about mopeds and feathered bipeds. My husband Rana and uh, one of our colleagues, Sriram and I um, were sitting and chatting one day and we got a call from uh, this company and they said, uh, we have a few birds on our campus. Can you please come and help uh, photograph them? So birds for us, like I explained, is very exciting because we've come from this bird watching family in Bangalore. And we thought uh, it's really exciting. Why don't we go uh, to this place? And next day we headed out and we reached TBS Motor Company, TBS Motors. Uh, this factory is located in Hosur in Tamil Nadu. And as soon as we stepped in, we were welcomed by birds on the lawn. So there were these cattle egrets, almost like saying, hello, we are here and look at us. And this was under the banner which said TVS Motor Company. And this itself was very exciting for us. Uh, it was a, like a nearly mist filled morning. We reached there early and we finished all the security check and these cattle egrets were waiting for us uh, with that background saying TVS Motor Company. And the management said, we'll uh, take you to this one place that we want to see. And we walked along uh, looking at uh, whatever was there around us, trees and birds. And we reached this spot, which really blew our mind away. We were almost literally dumbstruck because this, in this place, what we saw was painted stalks. And literally living up to their name, they had colored the whole place with their plumage of white and pink and dark green and with those orange beaks gleaming in the sunlight. We thought, okay, there are painted stocks, but what we saw next was something unbelievable. In a factory campus, there were these painted stocks and they were nesting. So there, as you can see in this image, there were a few birds which were preening, that is uh, getting set, uh, grooming their feathers to take off. And there were a few others who were sitting on their nests, which means that they were possibly eggs inside and they were incubating them. And this was something we did not expect at all, not definitely not in an automobile manufacturing company. And as we were looking at this, a loud buzzer uh, rang in the air. There was this loud sound and we turned around to look what the source of the sound was. And we saw that the employees of the factory had come, had stepped out to take their tea break. So there were all these people clad in uniform 
and they were standing under the shade of these badam trees. The trees, the leaves had also started changing color. It was that season. So there were a few uh, trees which were green. The rest were, had changed to uh, red already. And they were having a little banter, sipping tea. And it was an everyday routine for them to do this, looking at this scene. So they were looking at what was a heronry. It was not just painted stalks, but there were different kinds of water birds and they could sip tea looking at these water birds almost, not almost, literally every day, twice a day. And it was not just painted stalks, there were pelicans there. Like in this image, you can see that these pelicans were uh, fighting for space on that tree. And we counted around 144 pelicans on that day and they had painted that tree with white with their bird poop. And we thought this is something like many, many times more than what we could have imagined. And the staff said, why don't we go for a walk in the forest? And we said, absolutely, we would love to go along with you. And we were welcome to this yellow carpet welcome into the scrub forest inside TVS Motor Company. And we were looking around and there was life almost everywhere, wherever we turned. So there was this signature spider, there were butterflies fluttering around, and uh, there was this golden oriole, which first we heard the calls of the golden oriole, and then we were able to see it. This was mind blowing for us. And we uh, went further ahead and uh, there were other ponds. So there was not, it was not only that one pond, which we first saw, but there were uh, three or four ponds that these people had made. And as Shilpa had mentioned earlier, these were, these are man-made ponds, but there was life in every pond. As you can see here, there was this uh, dad chick, which was uh, swimming around. And then we took a turn around the bend and there was a watchtower and there was somebody on the watchtower watching us, this spotted owlet. So it was looking and watching us, ensuring that we wouldn't go too close. And it kept turning its head until we passed the watchtower. And this, is an aerial view. Um, sorry. Uh, okay, I'll show you the aerial view probably later. Uh, so they have 50 acres of uh, space in the campus dedicated to water bodies and forest areas. And like I showed you this uh, uh, pond here. So everything Every pond over here in uh, TVS Motors is filled with only rainwater. So the campus is so designed that the water percolates into these uh, different ponds and they have ensured that these ponds have water throughout the year. Yeah, so this is how it looks, it, uh, the aerial view. So you can see that uh, uh, this, the pond that you see in the center is, is the main pond and there are other ponds at different locations and uh, the campus is designed such that water flows into these ponds uh, when uh, it rains. And so we thought uh, we need, we can't do photography for one day. It's like what you guys have been doing. It has to be something that is done across seasons. And so we started visiting the factory from the next day onwards. And this is the site that you see. So these employees walk in to a campus, which is uh, rich in greenery and uh, a lot of flora and fauna. So you can see the temple trees there, uh, which are fragrant and give the employees a nice welcome when they enter the forest camp, uh, when, they, when they enter the factory campus. And then they get to park their vehicles under these trees of gold, which, are, which is Tabubia aurea. And the entire campus is such that it's picturesque. So you can see these jacaranda, trees in bloom and you have the employees, you have people who can walk on uh, carpeted pavements because it, almost every season there is some tree or the other flowering or some tree which is fruiting. And why this is working is because it's a policy which is driven from the top. So they have this uh, master plan which outlines uh, what is to be done in the manufacturing and the natural areas. So they use absolutely no pesticides and they have a policy which is driven from the top which says that no animals are to be harmed. So it's not just two wheelers that they manufacture. You can see that this uh, common mina is sitting 
uh, carrying nesting material and sitting on an auto, a three wheeler. And as we started coming back to the campus every day, we saw these painted stocks which uh, were carrying nesting material. So they would carry this and go to uh, the pond wherein there is an island and on the island there are these strong trees which can support nests uh, of these birds. And so they were building their nests. They would uh, like every day they would collect new twigs and come and uh, you know uh, make the nests better or repair the nests. And we, as we observed these painted stalks, we saw that uh, the chicks were born and uh, they were asking for food. And uh, the painted the adults would get them food. Initially, they would uh, they come and regurgitate, and then the chicks are able to feed on their own. Uh, and now, what you see here is. On the right side is an immature or a juvenile painted stork, which is uh, squabbling with an adult. And it's about to take off on its first flight. And then all the juveniles were there on the ground. They were able to forage for themselves. They were able to catch fish for themselves. And uh, it was time for them to take off and probably come back to the same place next year. And it was not just painted storks. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were other birds which were nesting there and what you see here is a young grey heron which is uh, asking, literally begging for food from its uh, parent. There were nearly around 12 or 15 nests of darter, that is the snake bird, which was also very special to us because in a small area like that, in that pond, you, we were able to see darter nests as well. And so this actually indicates that uh, all these birds have been coming back to that place for over 20 years now because they consider this to be a safe place and there is access to food, be it in that pond or um, in uh, any other water body which is outside of the factory campus. There were black capped night herons that were nesting and there were cormorants uh, also which were nesting in that uh, pond area. And we saw ducklings, which were in Dudley, of course. The spot-billed duck was moving around with its uh, uh, young ones. And as I showed you before, the dab chicks were having uh, chicks uh, as well. And then where there is prey like this, like chicks and fish, obviously there are Brahmini kites. So there, there was this uh, pair of Brahmini kites that used to hover and call almost all day looking for food. And there were terrapins, and, uh, which would come out and bask in the morning sun. And of course, the ubiquitous kingfisher. So this, we were able to sit for hours and observe uh, the behavior of these birds. So this always had a favorite perch, this common kingfisher. It would go and wherever it went, it would come back to the same perch and uh, tiny fish. And we were delighted to see hornbills, uh, paradise flycatchers, rollers. And as if on guard, the shikra would always perch itself on the security fence uh, as uh, a lookout. And it, it was always its favorite perch. There are over um, 110 species of birds that we have uh, documented in this factory campus. And we began to document other things like reptiles. Like this was a gecko, which is which was uh, uh, seated here, and this is a hide uh, behind which the employees get to see the birds. So they have been asked not to wander around in the open. So either they sip tea from a distance, or when they have to go and watch birds, it's behind a hide so that the birds are not disturbed. And one day while we were uh, standing here photographing this gecko, we saw something move in the water and that was this checkered keelback. It had come out into the open to bask uh, in the sun. And where there are snakes, uh, you have people who, the layman typically is afraid of snakes, right? I mean, you see a snake, the first thing, the first reaction is to get scared. So again, the management has a policy saying, do not kill snakes. So they have uh, ensured that, uh, as Shilpa was also mentioning, the uh, pretty much most 
most of the security personnel there are trained to capture the snakes carefully and relocate them in the same forest that they've come from that is within the campus so if at all any employee spots any snake within um, any of the buildings or maybe the canteen they don't react and they don't uh, uh, harm the snake but they report to the security who have the tools the right tools to capture the snakes and relocate them and as we were working in this campus we saw three of the big four uh, venomous snakes in this campus on the top left is the russell's viper and the one next to it is the common cray and below was uh, is the spectacle cobra and as we were walking along uh, we saw this rat snake which had just come out and was curled up in the sun and uh, why are these snakes present here it is because they have access to food which is toads and frogs and we have documented around nine species of frogs here so the skittering frog the sri lankan painted frog on the bottom left is the burrowing frog and then uh, the one on the bottom right corner is the tree frog so uh, this healthy uh, number of species in the campus indicates that the water is healthy because frogs are almost literally the barometer of a healthy water ecosystem and we were also uh, able to document a lot of species of dragonflies and damselflies and they were mating there as well which also indicates that the water that they have uh, been collecting is of a very good quality and most of the frogs that we documented here were uh, along this path which is this is uh, a banyan tree of several years uh, which is several years old and and the uh, water stream that you see below it is one of the channels that they have made such that the ponds that i was mentioning before that there are three to four ponds there so there is this overflow mechanism. So not only does the rainwater uh, get collected there from different parts of the factory, there is an overflow mechanism so that uh, if at all one pond uh, is full, then the rest of the water goes, flows into the next pond. And this is a, a similar mechanism that we have even in some of the lakes in Bangalore. So they are all interconnected lakes such that when you have one lake which is full, the water overflows to the next lake and hence the water level is maintained and these man-made water bodies are uh, designed are, are actually supposed to be designed such that they help in flood control and also to support different kinds of uh, biodiversity and not just uh, wildlife we have uh, several varieties of native and exotic plants and grass and shrubs and flowering trees uh, which you can see here and because there is this huge uh, presence of flora here that is around 200 species of trees apart from uh, nectar yielding uh, flowers we were able to see several species of butterflies i think there are uh, around 33 or more than 33 species of butterflies within the campus uh, and uh, once the monsoons set in, uh, there is this change that we were able to observe. That is, we, have, we were able to document different species of fungus as well, or mushrooms, and they would sprout up in uh, different locations in the most, uh, giving us one of the most beautiful images that we could meet. And one day as we were walking past, we saw this little butterfly uh, seated on this mushroom and almost nearly camouflaged with the color and texture of that tiny little mushroom and we walked past and we saw this uh, these insects which were there on a dead log and to us what this uh, indicates is that again as a policy if there is a dead log they don't go around cleaning it so they just let the forest be as it is and let nature take its own course so these insects and uh, like even when there are uh, if there is any other animal which is dead or there is a dead fruit, you have these creatures coming in to scavenge and perform their duty of, of the uh, life cycle. So they let things be and things happen um, on their own, like they take their own course of uh, duty. And there are several times that we've been 
cursing some creatures, which are these, the weaver ants. Sorry, the network glitch. Yeah. So th these weaver ants are everywhere. I'm sure you know about the weaver ants, which uh, basically take, uh, like the ants have these larvae and from the larva they extract this silk and with that silk they uh, connect leaves together to make their nests and these would drop from everywhere biting us uh, crazily some days and if not ants it would be mosquitoes which, which would literally uh, make a meal out of Sriram and me but uh, that apart uh, these, this to me indicates the classic teamwork which is what everybody I think uh, should aim for. And then another day while we were there at the pond looking at uh, the painted stalks again, uh, there is this bamboo clump which is there and my hand accidentally brushed one of the uh, branches and I saw something which fell down and I didn't know what it was. It, it, something like a thread fell down and then I turned around to see that thread was gone. And so I uh, gently tapped on that uh, twig again and this is what I saw. This, what you see here is, the, is a species called the poultice species or the tree trunk spider which almost looks like the knot on a bamboo branch. It, it literally looks like that. It's camouflaged so well and we found this there which uh, was quite something incredible for us to see. It, it would just roll down with the, that silk hanging and then go back up and camouflage itself, curl up and sit like a bamboo twig. And then another day we came back, it was the season, uh, the monsoon season, the first rains were just up and we were somewhere near the civil department and there was this huge commotion. There were uh, we could see a lot of birds flying around and uh, you can see this starred path where termites were emerging out from a hole. And uh, this was actually the reason for the commotion. There were kids, there were uh, minors and what was incredible for us was this Chatak Pakshi or the Jacobin Cuckoo which oh. was in the air uh, signaling the onset of monsoon and trying to grab its meal of a termite. Uh, we spent the whole day around, plonked ourselves near the civil department, looking at birds, capturing uh, their meal of the day. And as monsoon changed into winter, this is what we saw. There, there were uh, chestnut tail starlings and rosy starlings, which had literally filled all the trees in the campus. So we could see their uh, unique patterns as they fly uh, before they come to roost uh, and that's called the murmuration. So they would uh, come and roost in huge numbers like around uh, uh, 2000 or so and this was happening within the campus. And one interesting story be behind this uh, starlings is that because these birds are in such huge numbers, they also obviously poop a lot, right? and they would poop near the test tracks. So these people, the testers who need to test their bikes started complaining, saying that there's a lot of uh, bird poop on the ground and our bikes skid because of this and why can't you cut the trees? But you can't cut the trees for that, right? So they had to make a change in plan saying that we'll have a platform between the ground and the treetop so that the birds can do what they want to do, they can come back and rest, they can poop to their uh, mind's content and the testing goes on. So there is no, the birds are able to live on their own and the testers are able to go about with their duty. There's no change apart from a layer in between. So this to us meant uh, a lot because you, you have not, they have not cut the trees, they've let everything be in place while work also goes on as usual and the birds are able to go about their uh, work as well. And this is one of the oldest banyan trees in their campus and uh, my colleague Sriram spent quite a few hours in the night doing a light painting of this magnificent tree 
which is like a, it stands tall speaking volumes about uh, biodiversity and nature and as we were working in the night we were able to observe three species of owl in the campus this is the to the left is the indian scops owl and then there was the oriental scops owl and the one on the watchtower which is the spotted owlet and there were of course geckos and here is a gecko which is doing the typical gecko behavior of cleaning its eyes with its tongue and there were bats fruit bats which were feeding on cluster fig and while we were standing here photographing these uh, bats coming to get their grab a juicy fruit we heard a whistle in the background so we thought this must be the security guard who is uh, there are usually a few guards there who walk around with their dogs and keeping like you know part of the night beat night patrol so we thought it must be one of them and we turned to explain to them that we are here photographing bats but uh, we did not see anybody so where was the sound coming from so we went around looking and we found the source of the sound it was a slender lotus oh wow <laughs> beautiful there are nearly around 8 to 9 slender lotus that we have found in um, different locations in the campus which indicates that they have a safe uh, passage because they don't have anything that blocks them they can move around from tree to tree or from bamboo to bamboo and they are able to uh, live comfortably there as in sustain themselves because they have access to food as well and we had set up camera traps to see what else is there and we have documented uh, palm civets and you, as you can see in the bottom picture there are there is a mongoose with its young one which means that the mongoose mongooses are breeding within the campus and of course there uh, were jungle cats uh, which are also breeding and so we were doing uh, this camera trapping for a while and one day uh, we got a call from the management saying that their security guards had called them in the middle of the night at around 2 am saying uh, in tamil saying something walked in from the gate sir enna mo vandirchi enna mo vandirchi and they didn't know what it was it was the main gate security guy calling up uh, the big boss and saying something has come through the gate so we also hurried there next day we didn't know what it was we set up a few camera traps and after a few days we got to know what walked in to the main gate of tvs motors it was this a pangolin so they have a pangolin which walked right in through the main gate and it still is there somewhere inside the campus this was really something uh, momentous for us and also for them because the one the world's most traffic animal walked in through the campus and probably and hopefully still living there wow this is this is super information <laughs> wonderful because i am really I means i feel very sad uh, when sick people old people in our campus tell us that there used to be uh, the this particular animal in our campus some 10 years back when the campus was new and they had seen it once or twice but now we didn't see a single one so wow this is really nice it's really uh, special i i still haven't seen one in um, in the wild it is only it's only through these camera traps or what we get to see in zoos so this is camera trap it's 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 a beautiful image <laughs> it's a camera trap image okay wonderful so this is uh, a list of numbers of biodiversity that we have documented um, in the campus that's uh, around 110 species of birds 12 species of uh, mammals um, and butterflies snakes trees and it still counting and apart from giving protection to them what well, the unique thing that they are doing is they bring in the local school children from around hosur in tamil nadu and they take them on nature walks so they show them the heronry and they take them to what is called a butterfly garden that they've made uh, and they show them butterflies and whatever else that uh, they can show so it's a 
nature walk that is conducted for the local students uh, within their campus. And uh, what they are, the other sustainable activities that they are doing there is on the top left, what you see is a solar grid. So pretty much every building there has this, uh, these solar panels from which they are able to supply to the grid. So they supply power to the grid. And on the top right, you see this man who is uh, working on, in an effluent treatment system. So they treat the water uh, pretty well. And this treated water is what they use for watering the lawns. So it's not like uh, they use the usual water. So everything is uh, recycled over there. On the bottom left is an example of uh, composting that they do. This is vermicomposting. But apart from this, they do four different type, types of composting. One is uh, kitchen waste composting, that is peels and other things. And the food waste, which is uh, the waste that is leftover or uh, anything that uh, after people finish their meals, if any food is left over, that gets processed, composted as a different kind of um, uh, compost. And then uh, they have sludge composting, that is the paint sludge that they get, get uh, after painting their vehicles. So that also goes into a uh, separate kind of uh, composting mechanism. And they have leaf litter composting. So they have four different kinds of compost and they generate enough for them to use uh, within their own campus for their uh, trees and uh, lawns. And whatever excess they have, they give it, they donate it to the local farmers. So it, it runs up to around uh, probably hundreds of kilograms every year. And the local farmers have actually come back and said that the compost that you make and give us is of very good quality and it would be helpful if you can give us more. So they have been doing this and composting is something which is very close to my heart as well because I, we do composting at home, two different kinds of uh, composting. And on the bottom right, you can see that they have a nursery where they grow um, native uh, trees of native species as well as decorative and they use it for within their own campus and also give it to uh, people outside. And I would like to have you have this, have you have this thought in your mind. Dr. Salim Ali, who is the known as the father of ornithology, bird watching um, in India, had, had said, I suppose I've done my bit. It's now up to you, younger people. So it's up to us now to take his dream forward of protecting birds and not just birds, but all biodiversity. And this image of these mating millipedes openly on a grassy patch inside the factory campus gives me hope that if we let things be, if we don't interfere, if humans don't interfere, then a space can come back with, come back alive with uh, wildlife and they can sustain themselves on their own. So I'm open to questions and discussions, not just questions. Well, I'd like to know what camera you used to click those pictures. Oh, we were primarily using a mix of both uh, Canon and Nikon DSLR cameras. So 5D Mark III and uh, D... Uh, 70 the eight ten. So, Wendy, uh, can you stop your screen sharing? Yeah. It stopped, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello, ma'am. My name is Kayur. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, so what are, what is the duration of this documentation? So we spent uh, around a year or more documenting this because we had to uh, document the entire life cycle of the painted stock. That was the most important for us. So from the time that they start building their nest. So initially what happens is a few painted stocks come and they start selecting their nesting 
uh, spots and it's typically the same spot that a painted stock couple chooses year after year. So they come and they sometimes reuse what is already uh, left from the previous year and they start building the nest. So we had to start from that stage and go till uh, the chicks fly out. So the, like the juveniles fly out. So it was a year, slightly over a year because we had to cover all the seasons. Uh, do you have any advice for students or young graduates who are wanting to go into wildlife documentation or conservation? Um, what I can say is uh, if you're active with your biodiversity cell and constantly observing nature, because that's really the first step towards becoming either a photographer or a filmmaker, if that's what you plan to do, because you need to know your uh, uh, subjects well. So you need to know how to uh, give them space. What is a safe dis distance between you and uh, a butterfly, for example, or a bird. And when you start understanding their behavior, that is when you know how easily you can, uh, uh, how easily and safely you can document them. So I, I would recommend that you go more and more and observe nature on your own or with a group like uh, your biodiversity cell. If you do that, then um, I think that that should be the first step towards uh, um, making uh, your career in photography or filmmaking. And also I recommend uh, courses like, there is this course from ATRI, which is called the uh, Conservation biology course. So you could attend courses like these short courses also, which will give you an insight into conservation biology. So if you want to, you, you may not want to go, to go into photography or filmmaking, but you want to take up writing um, as well. So these are things that will help you uh, understand how to do the, like give you a hands-on uh, approach towards research and what kind of documentation goes in. And probably you could also uh, intern as in, in intern or volunteer with conservation organizations and that will give you some experience as well. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So Sugandhi, uh, you are, are not um, a professionally learned uh, this uh, filmmaking and all you, uh, in your bio. You are an um, IT person, but now turned into this. Uh, can you tell about that journey a little bit, how it started and all? Yeah, uh, I used to work as a software engineer in uh, an enterprise storage solutions company. I worked there for uh, quite a while. And for me, photography and uh, like this amateur handicap filmmaking was always a hobby. So I used to do that either uh, in one of the parks here or while on safari and uh, like I said Rana and I were always going out on these uh, safaris or bird watching tours uh, together uh, one because you know uh, we have all our relatives in Bangalore so it was an excuse to get out and <laughs> be unseen <laughs> so we, uh, it was an excuse but uh, to be amid nature was an, was the bigger reason so we would head out and uh, do this as a hobby and it gradually turned into a career but i i must say that it hasn't been easy because photography especially doesn't give you money doesn't give you money easily so it is a steep climb to even reach to a certain level so you need to uh, you can't expect big returns initially so it, it's a lot of learning and for me i have several mentors um, along my journey so people who, with whom i have um, worked while on the job and who have taught me a lot of uh, uh, things yeah so i've not come from film school but i've learned while on the job working with them even like uh, doing every small job so it helps so, and then how uh, National Geography and all these things happen? Uh, like in uh, Mid Lab, you got fellowship, all these things. Uh, so, National Geographic, because uh, 
what I'm doing right now is a documentation along the river Kaveri and it's been something special to both Rana and me for several years. So we've been working on um, smooth coated otters and uh, we've been studying them across different rivers in Karnataka. And it's taken several years for us to even get to this phase where we could apply for a grant and get uh, this grant from National Geographic. So it supports us to um, do this documentation. So how do you get there? It's basically your, uh, the kind of research uh, that you do and the kind of groundwork that you do. So you can't just get to some place without having uh, a body of right. work. So you will have to, like I said, you, you might want to even volunteer. Like I, even now I volunteer for Conservation India. So uh, where we do a lot of work related to wildlife conservation, be it uh, uh, running campaigns or writing articles, uh, like doing RTIs for uh, gathering information. So all this is background work. So what you see ultimately may just be a few good images, but behind that, is a lot of uh, work that involves research, um, getting your hands dirty, and yeah, it, it's a lot of hard work. Right, right. So I, for, if you want to become, if somebody is really looking at photography and all that, I would strongly recommend that you do that as a hobby first before um, diving into that as a profession. Because you learn the ropes of what it takes. Right, okay. right. So with this, uh, I'll just give an example, Sugandhi, what you said rightly, and I can give the example right here to the students who are interested. There is one student here today uh, among us. His name is Keur Bhatt. Keur, can you open your video? So Keur, he is a student of Simbasi School of Photography. And uh, he, luckily, he uh, joined uh, Simbasi in 2018 when we started biodiversity cell. And Keur is again an avid bird watcher uh, and um, a photographer. And he started with biodiversity cell. So as Sugandhi, you mentioned, he started walking with me on the campus. Students, you all also listen. So all my uh, walks, Skeur always, he was there. So he learned slowly, uh, but very dedicatedly. And now today, he is like a best student biodiversity cell. So he has won us uh, many uh, prizes also in film competitions. And he has been a strong support in each and every documentation we do on campus. So, so you name it. Uh, may it be a night walk for the reptiles and amphibians, may it, you have to go and just, you know, sit whole day in the sun or rain in the what, at the water body. Keur always walked and was there for us. So students, it's, it's just very much hard work and the interest you can show. And as Sugandhi mentioned, yes, Keur did it wonderfully. And uh, good job, Keur. <laughs> Good job. Thank you, ma'am. It's just because of you. <laughs> okay. Yes, to say that now. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, those who really want to, uh, you know, go ahead uh, and just have a, uh, your uh, hands dirty and want to see biodiversity and animals and birds, you have to start your work with biodiversity cell, is what Sugandhi rightly said. <laughs> Yeah, I think you'll get a chance to uh, observe different species or different kinds of work that uh, the cell is doing and you will find what interests you, whether it's uh, photography or writing or anything else. So, but you'll get to know the different aspects of what is being done and then you can pick what really excites you the most. Yeah. So, so Wendy, I'm really, you know, in a way, Keur is passing out this year. And for all our filmmaking and biodiversity documentation, whatever films we made, he was the uh, uh, main team head of our biodiversity cell. And now, after him, I'm really looking forward to means who I'm going to look up. Ma'am, I'm here. <laughs> okay, I Nick. <laughs> so, yeah, let's see. Uh, Ma'am, I want to, okay. if I want to become a wildlife Okay, yes, yes, yes. I mean, why do you start? 
uh, you were breaking, I think. Can you repeat it? I'm, I'm also from photography school. Uh, if I want to become a wildlife photographer, uh, where to start? So the best place to start is in your backyard, I would say. You start documenting what's around you and you can do the documentation for, I mean, for this year's documentation for the biodiversity cell. So you start working on all of that and then uh, you can progress to um, other places. Like I, I was telling initially, all the photography that we have done initially was all in the, in the lake that's four kilometers away from where I live now. So it, it's that and then just uh, two days back I had a a uh, family of red whiskered bulbuls that was um, in a flowering uh, plant in my backyard and the chick had come home. So it's, you will get to see a lot of these things if you just look around you. So you begin with that, improve upon your skills, and then you can move ahead from there. And what I, uh, it's not just about photography. You have to read about, read up about those, uh, the birds or whatever it is that you're photographing. So the more you know about it, the better you will be at the work. Yeah. Um, can I also ask Sugandhi a uh, question, Shilpa, if that's all right? Of course, of course, ma'am. Uh, hi, Sugandhi. This hi. is uh, uh, Richa. I teach at the Symbiosis School for Liberal Arts in Pune. And I'm also, Shilpa has also made me a member of the Biodiversity Cell. So I want to first congratulate you for such brilliant work and such a, I mean, a beautiful and vivid collection. It's extremely well done. And to say that you got, I mean, you didn't get, but a company to be so conscious that this kind of space has to be protected as birds habitat. And that is where so much of, I mean, so many of us are losing out. Puna is losing out in so many ways. Their habitats are getting destroyed. And we still, I mean, once in a while get to see such beautiful birds and they were a treat during the lockdown recently. Right. So I myself live next to a, a man-made lake in Pune called the Vishrantwadi Lake. And during the lockdown some months ago when they are starting again now, so this is, we are moving into the season, I get to see beautiful cranes and stalks and uh, Kingfishers and shikras more, I mean, not just this season, but uh, more often and some of the bulbuls and the munyas also more often. Uh, so I mean, uh, but also in the lake, there's, there's people throwing uh, all their plastic waste from and this it's private land so there's little we can do and we know how all of that uh, waste also impacts birds habitat and their nesting and the related problems so i mean what can one do to get society or maybe even these private developers more aware or even to get this body protected as a water body would you mean has have there been any success stories like that that you've been a part of or if you could uh, how did uh, TVS Motor Company, was it conscious of its own or was it a concentrated effort which involved environmental activists or otherwise? So would you just uh, speak a little on that? If Yeah. yeah. Uh, so at TVS, uh, what happened was several years ago, there was a severe drought in uh, that area and they were uh, almost running out of water and they had to figure out what they should do to ensure that there is water in their campus throughout. And they, that solution needed to be something which was sustainable, which is when they started thinking about rainwater harvesting and effluent treatment and all that. And of course, they consulted with uh, different experts, some of whom were also ornithologists. So we have our uh, local uh, bird watchers and ornithologists who they consulted and they gave them uh, ideas on what kind of trees should be planted in that island which could support a variety of uh, water birds. So they did consult with them. Uh, but one of the success stories that I can tell you uh, is of this lake called Kaikondrahalli Lake in Bangalore. So that was, that had almost turned into a, uh, like a garbage pit, a sewage pit. And it was only the locals who got together and they worked uh, to ensure that like garbage disposal is done in specific 
places and they took turns in volunteering. So they had people volunteers, like resident volunteers who initially started doing this kind of monitoring so that people don't throw garbage uh, here and there, not into the lake and things like that. And they work with the local municipal so that, uh, of course, you know, the government will have their own ideas and these guys want to conserve the lake, but it, it has to be a win-win. So they had, they made several trips to the local municipal, uh, convinced the corporator that uh, this lake has to be protected. So it was a collective voice and because of which the lake is now uh, a clean, fairly clean lake. And they even uh, prevented things like uh, during Ganpati festival, you, they come and dunk all the Ganesha idols there, right? So, so you cannot say no to something which is cultural, but they made a separate pond where people could still come. They come to the lake, they uh, immerse the idols in a separate place, but not inside the lake. So they have certain rules set in place. So you have to have only um, mud idols and not those which uh, have artificial uh, or toxic paint on them. So all these rules were set in place and it has uh, been um, a, a long journey, but the lake is now one of the best examples of uh, what has been revived. I could probably email you a link to the story. There's a video on YouTube. I'll share you the link. And uh, it's called Taikondhalli Lake. Taikondhalli, the uncommon story of an urban commons. I'll probably share the link uh, in the email that uh, Shilpa had sent out. Probably you could watch that and uh, you'll get an idea of how that can be done. And they're very strict about uh, um, waste, you, you know, the right kind of waste. They have a three-way waste management system. So the wet waste goes into one kind of uh, bin, the dry waste goes there and uh, anything else goes into the red bin. So all that is set in place. So it's fairly uh, well maintained. So it's, it's a very good example. I'll share you the link. So even with this, uh, Sugandhi and Richa, ma'am, I can tell, uh, say, that we are uh, inviting a Pune uh, people uh, who have worked on lakes and rivers. So uh, in the month of May, uh, two of those experts will be talking to us to look, especially look into the lakes and water bodies of Pune area. So I'll definitely uh, send that mail uh, to you, uh, and you will, uh, uh, and you and me as well will have. Uh, a better understanding of how to protect these water bodies in Pune area. And as Sugandhi mentioned, it has to be a collective effort. Only you and me can do, but yes, we can start it uh, somewhere, right? Yeah, we, we got a chance to work on that uh, documentary, do, do some additional camera work, and that's when we got to understand the whole um, process that went in, the, the locals, how they got together to doing it. So. It's really an inspiring story. I'll, I'll share it with you. So do you also have a documentation of bird sounds along with their names and all around t the TVS motors or anywhere else, Sugandhi, that we could look into? Uh, there's this website called Zeno Canto. Uh, let me spell it out for you in the chat. Okay, C-N-O hyphen C-A-N-T-O. If you visit this website, so there is this collection of bird calls from different parts of the world, but you could select uh, your own area and listen to bird calls. So they have calls based on whether it's a bird song, whether the bird is alarmed. And these are people who uh, are again, volunteers who go, uh, they are uh, enthusiasts who collect these bird songs and make them available for purposes of uh, research or education. So this is a very good uh, resource that you can look into. Even Marlene app and eBird also ha have these right. you know, photos yeah. and uh, even sound calls yeah. also. Yeah, yeah. ma'am, you can also have a look at uh, this eBird app or website first, and then you can download that app and start looking into the information like uh, how you can identify birds from their calls as well as their photographs, just putting your photograph and all. Which one did you say, Shilpa? Uh, it's eBird. eBird. Okay. Sure, yeah. 
eBird. Yeah, also the link to the video, Sugandhi. You said you'll forward it to Shilpa. Could you also leave it in the chat? I'll send it here. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah. So, Sugandhi, uh, who um, um, in TVS Motor, you can say, uh, is the most, uh, you know, at man management level, uh, is a, in a flagship holder for this all environmental work? It's the chairman who is driving this policy from the top. So he is very keen on having at, at least uh, 15 to 30% of their campus set aside as a white space. So okay. because yeah. it comes from the top, everybody else follows it. Yeah, and what's his good name? He's Mr. Venu Srinivasan. Okay. Yeah, that's true. It has to come from the top. In our case also, our Chancellor, Dr. S.B. Mujumdar, is the one who, who has been in the, been behind all these things and that's why we all are working and now it's percolating slowly to everyone yeah that's true so any other questions students sugandhi uh, uh, uh what about your uh, wildlife filmmaking uh like what good films uh, which you can name for students here um, so the films that I have made for uh, the Karnataka Forest Department are uh, titled Daroji, which is on one sloth bear family and the wildlife that lives uh, around them. This is in uh, this was filmed in Karnataka, and one of the most uh, recent films that uh, I have worked on is called Wings and Wetlands: A Story of Migration. This is about migratory birds that visit the wetlands within Karnataka. So these are uh, two of the films that I can name. And Where apart can from, we get to see uh, you? I'll share you the channel. It's, just hold on. I'll send you the link to the channel. Yeah. And apart from this, uh, I worked on uh, this film called Wild Karnataka, which uh, was also in theaters, I think, early last year or two yeah. years back. And I, I freelance for... Uh, different uh, wildlife productions of course on the brink uh, that's uh, a series that was aired on animal planet india and also on discovery that was a series on uh, uh, indian like species which are on the brink and uh, eight species were covered uh, as part of season one and uh, i filmed uh, for on the brink season one and uh, at the moment uh, um, I told you I'm working on smooth coated otters and also on a film called uh, The Real Jungle Book, um, which is about the jungle book species, which should be out uh, maybe uh, in uh, a year or two, I think. Wow. And, and for uh, National Geographic, I have uh, the society, I have filmed for uh, uh, this project called The Out of Eden Walk, which is uh, this journalist, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Paul Salopek who has been walking along the same path which the original humans took, like from Af Africa all the way to South America. So he's walking and he's in his, uh, I think, seventh or eighth year of walking across the world. And uh, we filmed uh, some part of his uh, walk in India, uh, in Varanasi. And also they had conducted uh, what are called slow journalism workshops. So that's also something that uh, uh, I got to film and that was really a very uh, special experience for me to be uh, filming such an epic uh, project like the Outfield Walk. It's a wonderful journey, Sugandhi. Uh, it really must be such a hard work. But let me ask you one question. Uh, so at what, uh, you know, after what uh, year or it's uh, when uh, it, uh, since you can say that wow, now it's all nice, whatever is happening, it's on place. And uh, when the things like this happen, National Geography, Animal Planet, you know, students, they look all these things in a glamorous way. Uh, so how you can guide on this, that when does these things happen and how and how long it took you to 
in a way stabilizing all these big channels and all these things it's a long journey <laughs> <laughs> easy so it took me quite a while uh, i after i switched uh, from my it job like from being a software developer to this i was even doing corporate films uh, uh, films that spoke about a company's uh, policy or uh, some features of that company and this is what i was doing so that i we could uh, sustain ourselves because money is really not easy in this specialized field oh, so right. it, it it's a long journey but if you focus if you know what exactly it is that you want to do and focus your energy into learning more about that then i think things will slowly start falling into place and i have to thank my mentors for giving me the right direction in, in uh, where to go and what to do okay so we are i think uh, at the end of the session uh, you can uh, come uh, with your say uh, questions if anyone has any question for sugandhi because i always have so many questions I, i want to ask so i'll take it later with sugandhi uh, so students if you want to ask anything uh, please go ahead otherwise we'll end now hello good afternoon ma'am uh, thank you for the wonderful session ma'am uh, i was curious about the course you were talking about the conservation biology course ma'am uh, what kind of courses are that uh, for how many days uh, that course go on for and what are the pieces if there are in uh, can you describe yeah the one i attended uh, was from a3 which is called the conservation biology course it was for around 3 weeks i think the fee was very minimal it was 500 rupees if i remember right so because they want to support people who are getting into conservation and people from different walks of life who could help in conservation Uh, in different ways like i said so they could themselves become biologists and do further research or they could be writers or uh, like me i was a filmmaker and for all these fields it's necessary to know the science behind what you're talking and that's what you'll get to learn in courses like this uh, there's also uh, a course about uh, uh, ornithology on bnhs which i think should also be fairly uh, affordable i don't know the uh, price for that but bnhs has courses which you could uh, sign up for and do it from where you are those are courses for which uh, you need to submit assignments online and uh, ncf has started nature conservation foundation has started a few courses uh, for uh, writers i think and also for uh, budding naturalists and these uh, of course the one for naturalists is for those who are uh, people who either have low or no income but you could uh, look into the other courses which are primarily about writing about conservation and uh, there is this institute called ncbs in bangalore national center for biological sciences so that's another place where again people from different backgrounds go and study wildlife and from there they have branched out into different fields as well uh, this i think is a collaboration between ncbs and uh, wildlife institute of india this is a two year course so you will have something like an entrance exam and after that you can pursue the course you will have experts from the wildlife industry who will uh, coach you and guide you thank you so much ma'am uh, also uh, udbhav uh, i have given one link ecological society so this is a pune based uh, organization and uh, one of our um, biodiversity uh, head um, dr gurudas nulkar he is faculty in this course it's a wonderful course uh, started by prakash gore one of the conservationist in pune i i just did this course this year it's a wonderful course it's on saturday sundays and uh, classes are only on saturdays for four hours so you can have a look at this course even richa ma'am you also can have a look at this course and even students who want to uh, know as sugandhi said uh, know about wildlife conservation and overall environmental aspects it's a wonderful course uh, just one correction uh, i said the ncbs and wai are uh, together but they are alternate courses there is one course by 
NCBS and uh, another different course by WII. Both are two-year courses and they are uh, offered in alternate years. Okay. Just, uh, and it, it'll be something like an MSc in wildlife biology. No short-term courses. Mm -hmm. So, Richa, ma'am, this is very a uh, good course for people like us or uh, this ecological society course. It's only, it's only on Saturday for four hour, four to five hours, and it's online right now. So this year I finished this course online only, and it, it, it's very nice course. Sounds good. Yeah. So, Thanks so much, Sugandhi. Wonderful interacting with you. Wonderful presentation, yeah. And it was great interacting with all of you also. And thanks uh, once again to the Biodiversity Cell and to Shilpa and all the volunteers. Yeah. So I think we, uh, we have come to end of this uh, today's Sunday special session. So now I'll request our uh, team member to come ahead to thank our uh, resource person. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Okay, so I Pratishtha Bhagai on behalf of Symb uh, Symbiosis University's Biodiversity Cell would like to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Ms. Sugandhi Gadadhar for sharing her very, 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 you know, ex like experienced um, findings and her opinions with us today. Uh, I think w when we are living in jungles of concrete, we have got disconnected from nature. And we have even forgotten that even a greater artist than man is God himself who has created nature. And nature never uh, fails to astonish us in its own ways. So as ma'am shared with us uh, the beauty of nature which were captured on lens, I could not help out but wonder how lucky are those who, are, who can actually capture it in their memory with their own eyes. Because we, we in cities do not really see them. Uh, it is like very um, startling to see that we share this land with many, millions of species of flora and fauna and yet they escape our eyes because they camouflage or we are ignorant towards them. So when Sugandhi ma'am showed us so many uh, uh, pictures of native and exotic species of birds, insects, butterflies, frogs, snakes, trees, plants and animals, I was really enchanted by how wonderful and colorful they were. And uh, my takeaway from today's presentation was that humans do not interact with nature in their best ways. But I think we are definitely improving as ma'am mentioned about the um, improving trends in uh, men's interaction with nature. And uh, we are improving for better. I think we have to make our minds to appreciate and sustain nature in better ways. And only if we respect nature will nature respect us. I thank every one of you for obliging us uh, with your presence. And especially ma'am for sharing the amazing visuals with us. They were really enthralling. I, I really hope today's session was enjoyable for you all and you learned something new today. Thank you everyone. Thanks Patishta. So thanks, Thank Sugandhi, uh, once again, and see you again uh, for uh, more of your work uh, to share with our, our students. Thank you very much. Thank Have a nice welcome. Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Richa, ma'am. Thanks for joining us today. And Thank you so much, Shilpa, uh, for asking me. <laughs> and Sugandhi, thanks all of you. Wonderfully organized. Uh, Great event. Thank thanks. you. Thank you all so much. Students. Thank you very much. See you on next Sunday. Next Sunday, we are going to have another wonderful session uh, with an, another a uniquely gifted uh, resource person is coming in the next Sunday. So see you guys. Bye. Bye. So team, you stay back. Pratishta, Jessica. Uh,